It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here to talk about this. Um, Roger put the fear into all of the presenters of not going over time. Um, so I'm aware my talk really is sort of a broad strokes um, introduction to this area, which may be new to some of you. Um, but if anyone wants more details, I'm happy to communicate after or, or by email. So I think this is one of the most striking facts in modern medicine. There are at least 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in your body. So each of us is actually more bacterial than we are human. And most of these bacteria are actually located in our distal gut. So you might wonder how this relates to mood disorders. I think if you reflect, though, the connection between the gut and the brain is actually evident even in our common lexicon. So we talk about trusting your gut, your gut reaction to something, butterflies in your stomach, sick to your stomach with strong emotions. We all know that when a lot is happening in terms of emotion and stress, we do experience symptoms in our gut, and that there is this strong relationship between what's happening our, in our gut and what's happening in our brain. And so I hope by the end of the talk today, I've convinced you that there is emerging evidence that what's happening in our gut in terms of inflammation, changes in the bacteria there, may be important in terms of understanding mood disorders and other changes in the brain and behavior. So again, just I'm going to do a broad strokes overview of the gut-brain axis. And then I've chosen to present one illustrative animal study. In the time allotted, I couldn't go through the wealth of animal data in this area. So I've chosen one study that I think shows the incredible promise in this area. And then we'll review some emerging studies of depression in the gut microbiome. And then I wanted to do a little bit of clinically relevant uh, work based on the pre-survey many of you completed. There was an interest in sort of practical take-home points, so I'll try to tie some of that in and then talk about sort of future directions in a summary. So the gut and the brain are connected by multiple bi-directional pathways. So the one you may be familiar with from medical school or other training you've all done is the vagus nerve, which connects the gut and the brain. Uh, there's also, though, important inflammatory pathways that connect the gut and the brain and hormonal pathways that connect the gut and the brain. So both top-down, things like the HPA axis we're all familiar with, will signal to the gut, and then also uh, signaling cascades around rising from the gut cells that can signal up to the brain. And what I'm most interested in are all the critters underneath. So those are the gut bacteria that signal to all of these pathways. So the gut bacteria can signal to afferent nerve cells that signal up to the brain. They can trigger inflammatory cascades that then affect the brain. And we've heard a lot about what some of those pathways are. And they can also trigger hormonal cascades. Interestingly, the gut bacteria themselves can actually secrete neurotransmitters. So there are certain gut bacteria that secrete noradrenaline, secrete GABA, secrete serotonin. So it really isn't a stretch to think about how these gut bacteria affect the brain. It's really quite remarkable. The gut bacteria is usually relatively um, unstable in early life till around age three. Then it becomes more stable through adulthood, and then it becomes unstable again in the elderly. Um, it can be affected by things like antibiotic use, obviously, probiotic use, but also things like diet, migration. We also now know that mode of delivery is important. So if you're born by C-section, you might have a different gut microbiome in early life than someone born by vaginal delivery who's exposed to the mother's vaginal microbiome. So there are a number of things that can change and modify the gut bacteria bacteria. So I want to just take you through a study that I think shows you that the gut bacteria may be a driver in changes in the brain and behavior, not just a downstream uh, targeted effector of inflammatory pathways, that maybe the gut microbiome can actually change the brain and behavior. So this is a study coming out of our group at McMaster University at the Farncombe Institute, so it's Steve uh, Collins and Chemek Bursick's lab. And they took advantage of a long recognized fact that valve C lab mice tend to be very timid and anxious. And NIH Swiss lab mice tend to be much more exploratory and gregarious. And this has been long recognized. So they used our germ-free facility. And they could raise these mice without any exposure to bacteria. 
So they took the normally timid, anxious valve sea mouse that's never been exposed to bacteria and gave it the gut bacteria from the usually exploratory, outgoing NIH Swiss mouse, and they could make it exploratory. And similarly, if they took the normally outgoing, exploratory NIH Swiss mouse that's never been exposed to any bacteria and gave it the gut bacteria of the normally anxious valve sea mouse, they could make it anxious. So it suggests that the gut bacteria can actually directly drive this phenotype. And these changes were paralleled by central changes in BDNF and noradrenaline as well. So it was actually changing the brain and the behavior. There is a wealth of uh, data supporting these sorts of studies. There are studies showing that um, the gut bacteria probably shapes our stress response during a critical period in early life. Um, there are studies showing that social stressors change the gut microbiome. These are all in animals. There has been a paucity of translational clinical studies in people with psychiatric illness. So in the last year, we've had the very first two studies ever come out, and they were both in depression. Um, one study of 46 patients, the other of 37, so small sample sizes. But they both showed statistically significant changes in the profile of gut bacteria in the patients compared to controls. Um, these uh, studies have been somewhat criticized in terms of the methodology of how they accounted for multiple comparisons, things like that, but they're all we have. They're the first studies, so they're important in sort of laying some groundwork. What I think was most interesting in these studies is they both showed changes in two gut bacteria, Allostipes and Oscillobacter. Now, allostipes is involved in indole metabolism, so it can affect tryptophan and serotonin levels. So there's a good biological plausibility for this being involved in mood disorders. Oscillobacter actually secretes a GABAergic-like compound. So again, real biological plausibility and pathways that we can start to explore. So in studies we're doing, we're actually culturing out these particular bacteria and looking at metabolomics to try and see whether we can identify what they're doing that might be important in, in depression and mood disorders. So I want to shift gears a little bit. I hope I've convinced you that changing gut bacteria and changes in those profiles might be able to change the brain and behavior. And the flip side of that is this comorbidity that we've long been aware of between patients who have GI disorders and patients who have mood disorders. So many of you who see patients would already know that there is significant comorbidity. Um, so I like to put up one number. Of course, there's lots of different prevalence studies showing lots of different numbers, but the take home is that about half of patients with IBS will have a mood disorder and about a third of patients with IBD will have a mood disorder. So this is significant, and I'm sure all of you treating patients with mood disorders recognize this. I think we all have been guilty at some times of treating the mood disorder and sort of parking the GI disorder to the side. So I actually started a GI psychiatry clinic where we provide integrated care for patients with GI illness and psychiatric comorbidity because often the GI symptoms are driving some of their psychiatric symptoms. So people that are anxious about going out for dinner because it'll trigger their IBS symptoms, anxious about having an accident as a result of their Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. So I think really integrated care is best. Many of you already know this, that there is a lack of RCT evidence to guide antidepressant choice in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And in irritable bowel syndrome, everything seems to work. So there are lovely meta-analyses showing that tricyclics, SSRIs, SNRIs, they all seem to work for IBS. So when we're selecting uh, pharmacological treatments for patients with GI illness and psychiatric comorbidity, we really often end up taking advantage of side effect profiles. Um, so if a patient has prominent diarrhea, can we constipate them a little bit with a TCA? Patients who have prominent constipation, can we reverse that a little bit with an agent? What I will say, and I'm interested if, if others have had this experience, that I think sometimes we pejoratively uh, uh, hold back on pharmacological treatment because we think we're going to worsen their symptoms. So sometimes patients may not be given an SSRI because there's worry it will worsen their diarrhea. I will say after treating many of these patients, 
they just seem to be able to tolerate medications. And I'm not sure if it's because they already have this much diarrhea, so a little bit of an addition just doesn't register, or if it's affecting them in different pharmacological ways. Um, but most patients can tolerate. But really, integrated care is best. So a lot of these patients have difficulties in terms of role transition, of getting an ostomy, or some of the psychosocial effects um, of their illness. So similar to the bariatric patients, really, they often benefit from mindfulness training, CBT training, IPT, and so uh, where it's possible to offer integrated care, that's best. The other sort of clinical practicality that comes out of thinking of the interaction between uh, the gut system and psychiatric patients is the risk of GI bleeding with SSRI. So I get asked about this a lot. So we did a systematic review and meta-analysis that was published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology and we found an odds ratio of about 1.66. And other meta-analyses um, have shown very similar odds ratios. So this seems to be the number. That translates to a number needed to harm of about one to 3,000, depending on whether you're a low-risk population like the Netherlands, high-risk population like the United States, we're somewhere in between. So in reality, for the average healthy patient with a mood disorder or other psychiatric illness who you're starting on an SSRI, this is probably not significant. That said, I warn patients about serotonin syndrome, which we very rarely see, so I think it merits educating the patient about the risk, but for most patients, it's probably minimal. Where it seems to become important is where SSRIs are combined with NSAIDs. So here we see a jump in the odds ratio for, to over four. So that starts to become clinically relevant. So in this case, what I recommend is really reevaluating the clinical indication for both the SSRI and the NSAID. Is there one that can be stopped, that isn't felt to be helpful or necessary? If both are felt to be essential, then considering adding a PPI, and that can be done in discussion with the family doctor or the gastroenterologist if, if there is one. The other situation where it's obviously relevant is in patients who are at very high risk of bleeding. So patients on anticoagulant medications, patients presenting with a GI bleed, history of GI bleed, advanced liver cirrhosis. In those patients, this probably becomes a meaningful effect. And in that case, again, it's about reevaluating the need for the medication. If it's felt to be essential, you continue it, but the patient is informed about the risk and makes an educated decision. There is some literature that the risk of GI bleeding is associated with the affinity for the serotonin receptor, so switching to a medication with a lower affinity like mirtazapine could be beneficial. There isn't good data from meta-analyses to support that, but there's some nice studies suggesting that, so that sometimes if you're going to start a medication in someone at elevated risk, that might be something you take into account. Um, the mechanism is likely due to platelet effects, but there's some suggestion there's also um, effects of SSRIs directly on gastric acid secretion. So again, in someone at elevated risk, not on an NSAID, it might be reasonable to consider a PPI uh, in discussion with our medical colleagues. So I think this is a real effect, but in the average healthy patient, probably not a reason to not start a medication. And in other patients, not necessarily a reason to stop the medications, but it really merits a good discussion of the risk and benefit ratio. So to bring it full circle, does the future of psychiatry lie in the gut? Uh, as Roger was alluding to, back in the early 1900s, there was a theory of auto-intoxication and that melancholia was caused by a toxic substance arising in the gut. They started doing colectomies for depression with mortality rates of upwards of 30%, but there really was no science to back that up, so it quickly sort of moved into quackery. I think we're at risk of that happening again. There's a wealth of animal data, but a paucity of clinical studies. Yet the Atlantic, the New York Times, they're all running editorials on you know, the gut being, being the source of depression. So I think we as professionals have to be careful to be interested, but really wait for good, rigorous scientific studies before we, um, before we advise patients on any treatments. That said, I will put it to you that it has been challenging to understand the pathophysiology of psychiatric illness. We know genetic factors are important, epigenetic, environmental, social. We're hearing about inflammatory <coughs> metabolic factors. And it's been difficult to bring all of these things together. And I will put it to you that the microbiome gut-brain axis 
is an attractive way of drawing together some multiple lines of thinking that we know have been important in psychiatry. So the microbiome links together diet, stress, pain, infection, urbanicity, HPA axis, inflammation, neurotransmitters, early life events, neurodevelopment. All of these are impacted by the microbiome. I think it would be naive to think there's going to be one bug in the gut that causes depression. But I do think that the microbiome may be one of the pathways, particularly in a subset of patients with IBS or other GI symptoms, that may be driving some of the inflammatory metabolic changes that we're hearing about that are so important. So I think it merits rigorous investigation. Time will tell whether this is meriting intervention and prevention targeted uh, strategies. When we have that data, though, there are good ways of changing dysbiosis and abnormalities in the profile in the microbiome. So in the GI world, we do good randomized control trials of fecal transplantation, antibiotic treatment trials. Does minocycline work by affecting the gut microbiome? Roger can tell us one day. Um, and you know, uh, probiotic, prebiotic studies. So I think it's an emerging field. We don't want to oversell it, but I think it's a very exciting way of linking together multiple lines of thinking. So thank you.